the Collaborative on Global Children's Issues at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. in September 2021. Um, our goal was to foster cross-disciplinary research and dialogue on critical and emerging issues affecting children around the world, with a particular focus on children experiencing adversity, but also discovering pathways to their resilience. One of our core beliefs at the Collaborative is that some of the most important learning about child protection is happening on the ground. It's with the communities that are doing whatever they can to respond to children facing a range of challenges. And these frontline responses are often very innovative. They're usually underfunded, sometimes not funded at all. And our goal at the Collaborative is to understand them better, to lift them up, to shine a light on them, and to bring the learning and the questions and the recommendations back into the university context, to Washington, DC, and into the global community of scholars, practitioners, and policymakers who are committed to doing child-centered work in the world. So our goals with the collaborative is to commit to creating opportunities that are truly child-centered, that are grounded in the lived experiences of children, their families, and communities, that are responsive to current and emerging needs, and useful to actors working in a variety of contexts and capacities to meet them. Always evidence-informed and solutions-oriented, and building effective bridges between stakeholders involved in practice, policy, and research. It's important to note that the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most widely ratified human rights treaty in the world, affirms the right to children's participation in all matters that affect them. And we believe that this includes research, and it includes policy, and it includes practice. So our conversation partners today are the research fellows working around the world with the collaborative, um, and they are exemplars of this commitment to children's participation. Their work is not easy, but it's truly inspiring, and I'm excited to introduce them to you today. We have others who are part of the collaborative who are not on the screen today, that includes Dr. Joan Lombardi, who's a senior research fellow with the Collaborative. She helped found it um, with me. And Sweta Shah is a research fellow who um, is also part of this team. She wasn't able to join today, but she did do a webinar a few weeks ago presenting her um, new book. So we'll share a link to that as well in the chat. So I'm going to start by welcoming you, Mara, Vlad, Stephen, Gabriela. And maybe we can talk about what brought you into this child-centered work. Stephen, can I start with you? Sure. So it's wonderful to be here. Uh, so I'm Stephen. I'm originally from Uruguay. And uh, the last 25 years, I've uh, worked in programs with children, families, um, impacted by violence, by conflict, by training. I'm a therapist, a social worker. I also have a law degree. I've worked in the international humanitarian space. I've worked in West Africa, East Africa, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, um, always on programs with unaccompanied, separated children, uh, pre-conflict, post-conflict, in the midst of conflict, um, including, for example, in 2006, the Israel-Hezbollah war. Um, I've also worked in the United States. I've worked in the New York City child welfare system. Um, and that has been sort of my journey and where I am right now is half of my life is as a family therapist. The other half is I work with different organizations, uh, whether domestically or internationally, including, for example, the U.S. government on unaccompanied children on the border, uh, whether working here in New York City uh, with uh, supporting initiatives uh, for young people leaving the child welfare system or looking at global issues connected to uh, child sexual abuse and restorative justice. Um, and other similar type issues. But it's just fantastic to be here and I'm really looking forward uh, to our conversation and to the questions from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. He didn't mention his work related to uh, child rights and religion, but <laughs> we'll get to that in another webinar. Clearly a, a wide background. Vlad, 
Greetings. Welcome to this conversation from Ukraine. What brought you to this work? Thank you, Gilan. Good morning to all. I am uh, Vlad. I am a researcher from uh, Kiev, from Ukraine. And uh, my uh, research focus is uh, uh, considered in uh, uh, forcible deportation and militarization and the problem of Russification of Ukrainian children when uh, Russia uh, soldiers and Russia government try to uh, take it away from Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian children to Russia and what they do with these children after that. Uh, this uh, uh, research I started after a full-scale invasion uh, in Ukraine in 2022, when Russia uh, uh, army of uh, Russian Federation uh, uh, started uh, war against Ukraine. Uh, before full-scale invasion, uh, I worked as a researcher in a history and in religion studies and uh, working with my PhD thesis about uh, a role of Catholic Church during uh, World War II and uh, uh, about uh, what our relationships uh, have Catholic bishops with Jewish community in uh, Second World uh, War II. Uh, but after that, uh, after uh, war uh, came to Ukraine, I am uh, try to find uh, uh, all available sources uh, what could be helpful to Ukraine in defending its independence. And uh, uh, as a spe specialist in religion, uh, uh, I have uh, several contacts in church and uh, uh, we have a collaboration with a charity foundation, we, uh, Caritas, named Caritas, and uh, we began transferring food and medicine to Ukrainian children who are in uh, living in war zone. Uh, uh, and uh, after that, uh, I began researching uh, a problem of mass deportation and uh, forcible tra transfer of uh, Ukrainian children to Russia. Uh, why they do this criminal practice? Uh, how many children are involved in, uh, in this process, uh, who are involved from Russian governments in this process. And uh, uh, I'm trying to collect a lot, a lot of information about that. And many of international and Ukrainian media uh, share information about new and new evidence uh, about this criminal practice. For, for example, we know about evidence uh, that <clears throat> Russian uh, army uh, deported children from Donetsk region, from uh, Crimea, from Kherson region. And we try to collect this information and try to identify uh, this information about who especially Ukrainian children are taken away from Ukraine to Russia. And that's why I'm uh, still continue uh, investigating this problem and to try to share this important information, information to international society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vlad. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary to think that, you know, Vlad came into this work studying history and then got caught up in the living history, right? I mean, the fact that history is repeating itself. So um, really helpful putting what's happening now also into a historical context, noting that this isn't the first time that this has happened to Ukrainian children. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Gabriela. Hi there. Good morning. And thanks to, to all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Gabriela Sanchez, and I'm a sociocultural anthropologist. And I came into this work for kind of like a neutral pathway as well. I was actually a law enforcement officer on the U.S.-Mexico border. For seven years, I was involved in the um, identification and prosecution of cases, of criminal cases that were related to migration. And that was, um, I was part of the jurisdiction or the first jurisdiction that introduced mm, a statute against migrant smuggling, that is the facilitation of border crossings for profit in the, well, along the, the US-Mexico border. And, and the work from the US-Mexico border was 
um, an experience that allowed me or, or that, that I was able to, to translate um, and to, to take to other places around the world. I've conducted work along um, North Africa, Europe, and um, Australia, also looking at the facilitation of border crossings. One of the, but I actually started to look into the, the participation of young people when as part of the testimonies of uh, survival and resistance of people as they were crossing borders, they started to mention young guides, um, teenagers, primarily boys that were guiding them across the border, uh, that were encouraging them, uh, that were carrying their bags and or that they were helping them hide you know, or reach a destination. Um, and at that point, you know, a lot of people told me like, well, we cannot really talk about children because we're not supposed to do research about children. But I was, I started to become more and more concerned about how not taking into consideration the perspectives of young people um, was obscuring a lot of the dynamics that were actually occurring on the ground related to um, migration facilitation. And that's how I ended up here. <laughs> So very, very excited to be here. And thanks to all of you for joining. Thank you, Gabriela. Yeah, it's so fascinating to just see the different ways you've and you've entered the space from different angles, which I think is one thing I love about the work that we're doing in our field is that it is so multidisciplinary and there's so many different points of access um, and that we kind of need each other, right? To whether we're entering from you know, a historical perspective or a therapy perspective or a policy perspective or just living on the border and being interested. Um, there's so many ways to come in and we need these diverse perspectives as we crack these difficult nuts, right, that are affecting children. Mara. Yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Like Stephen, I come from the southern cone of South America, so from Argentina. Uh, I am initially in the middle and finally from Argentina, so I, my Argentine identity is very strong. And the reason why I started working on children's rights or I became interested in this, that I have said it before in a Q&A with Georgetown, so I can share it too, is the um, admi my admiration for teenagers and very young people that were murdered during our latest dictatorship who were activists and um, union leaders, students, etc., cetera, um, and who were activists so that other children and future generations would have a more equal society and more just society. And like the one that we have now, since Argentina is an extremely unequal and just country. Besides children, I take an interest in women's rights because as we know, women and teenagers, uh, girls, are the main caregivers of children worldwide. So statistically, and it is the same in Latin America. So after my work in children that focused mainly on international advocacy mechanisms, I realized that it was important also to expand my interest into other minorities and into other groups that are being oppressed, at least in our societies. So thank you very much uh, for being here and I am looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mara. We're gonna continue with you. I think we'll now get in a little bit more into depth into the projects that you're working on now. Um, so we'll stick with you, Mara, since you're, I think we're in this conversation, we're gonna follow a little bit um, the migration pathway um, because three of you are specifically working on children on the move uh, between South America, Central America and the United States. And then Vlad is, of course, also dealing with children on the move, but forcibly displaced um, and deported. So we'll start with the United States, and then we're going to move back over to Ukraine. And you can feel the links between these global phenomena. So Mara, over to you. There's growing consensus that global development and humanitarian assistance must become more responsive to the needs and priorities of local actors and communities and embrace their ideas about how to address the challenges they face. And your work has um, 
currently specifically focuses on learning from communities experiencing displacement and migration in Guatemala and their efforts to support early childhood development and protection for young children on the move. We don't often hear about that. Um, so what are you learning from these frontline innovators and how can international organizations, whether it's USAID or large international non-governmental organizations, and donors incorporate this kind of learning into their initiatives to support local actors. Yes, so I will give an answer and explain what we are doing at the same time, because the reason why um, I decided to focus on Guatemala, as you know, originally the project was about the Northern Triangle, but I don't agree with addressing the whole South region, like if it was one single country, which is what happens ends up happening sometimes. Um, and Guatemala is uh, the, the scenario of a neglected crisis because of different reasons. Uh, first is the, the interest in people on the move across the America in the past decade, in the past, in the past years, in the past decade, that uh, led the situation of internally displaced Guatemalans to be a little bit neglected, the same Guatemalans that are returned after living in the U.S. or trying to cross the border or after living in Mexico and who are trying to reintegrate into their societies. This uh, overlaps with a uh, long-standing discrimination against indigenous peoples because we know this in the, the areas where I did field work, that is the Western Highlands. Most migrants uh, internationally are indigenous people, so Mayan uh, ethnic, ethnic peoples, let's say. And that's why we, start, we decided to focus on this. So on different topics that have been neglected by international cooperation. So this is one, one of the answers. I invite international cooperation agencies to focus or to pay attention to these crises and these type of issues that are usually neglected or that are not uh, that much on the agenda. Also, we are focusing on early childhood development, uh, which is also another issue that is not a top priority when it comes to children on the move. There's much more research, interest, programs, services, etc., on, for example, child protection, the prevention of violence, and on anything that is connected to keeping children alive. Uh, so wash, um, vaccinations, uh, healthcare, so other other topics that are not integrated early childhood development, which is what we are looking at here. I learned a lot from the organizations that I met and that I interviewed in Guatemala, so it is hard to summarize um, all of the findings, uh, but Something that caught my attention and that is connected to research and to the creation of knowledge, which is what we do at the university, is that many organizations identified as an issue the lack of fund, flexible funding directed towards publishing their methodology, you know, their methods, their methodologies, have developing their own monitoring and evaluation frameworks, their own evaluations that are uh, critical evaluations of the work that they do in early childhood development. This concise or overlaps with research findings in the Latin American context, in the migration context, child migration context, that is that there aren't so many critical evaluations of NGOs, interventions or programs, and there's more need for that, and more need also for extensive needs assessment. So uh, donors can also focus on this extensive in-depth needs assessments that have child participation and the participation of families in them. So not only speaking to local organizations or national NGOs, but also speaking to community-based organizations that where the members are also members of the community. So basically their life is interacting with those populations. So re 
uh, reiterated migrants or people that are at risk of migrating or who are at risk of having to flee their communities, etc. And really taking into consideration their inputs. As we know, we can request a feedback and input for, from children using many methodologies and including many ages of children. Uh, what usually ends up happening is that there's more youth participation than child participation. So young children are the ones that are the most neglected in these types of participatory processes. And so uh, that is another topic uh, that donors could pay more attention to. So the participation of uh, children within early childhood, which is from zero to eight years old. In our case, we are focusing on children from zero to six and their families. And finally, another need uh, that we identified in Guatemala with the organizations that we interviewed that, of course, thank you very much, everyone who was interviewed by me. Um, they are uh, mentioned in the blog post uh, that we are going to share. Is that uh, given that in the Guatemalan context, especially in the highlands and the places where I did field work, there are so, a large proportion of mo mothers or caregivers are teenage moms, so adolescent moms. Um, for example, last year in Guatemala, it was something like 70,000 women and girls gave birth who were below the age of 19, so very young mothers. Participatory processes, needs assessments that are based on these participatory approaches need to compulsorily uh, include teenage moms. So teenagers, not only as recipients of programs or you know, a citizen that can be actively engaged in, in improving international cooperation services and initiatives, but also as caregivers and adults who have caregiving responsibilities. So both as both roles, let's say. And um, I, can, I can continue speaking forever, but I think that those are the main findings that we have. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that I really appreciated about your work is how you're kind of um, breaking down the silos between this focus on women, migrants, and the focus on children. I mean, in real life, like people don't exist in silos, right? <laughs> women are caregivers, they're with children. And you have done a really beautiful job of bringing that together and looking at two generation approaches, right? That in order to support children on the move, of course, we need to support caregivers. and what kind of programs go together um, and that are really being mindful about um, tackling both at the same time. And I also just want to give uh, acknowledgement to the Bainham Family Foundation, which has been supporting Mara's work. Um, and it's also allowing us to create a space to bring the learning from these communities in Guatemala into policy dialogue um, with global development partners, including USAID, and some of the actors on the ground. So Mara's not only doing the research, but she's also facilitating this conversation between research policy and practice, um, which is so exciting. Um, and we want to do more of that. So thank, thank you, you very for much. leading the just, just one more thing. Sure. <laughs> because this is important. One of the needs uh, identified by a systemic review by ODI and UNICEF last year, which is all, which overlaps with our project too, is um, the need to do evaluations generally that are critical, as I said before, but in particular, um, I would like to see many, many more critical evaluations of localization efforts, mm -hmm. because we have, I, by now we must have hundreds of reports on how to do localization because each and every NGO or multilateral organization has their own report on localization and their methodology and so on and so forth. But it is important to see how these efforts are being uh, actually implemented on the ground. And that is another recommendation for donors also to pull resources if they don't have enough resources themselves, uh, but to pull resources or to collaborate with universities or with other donor organizations to uh, produce this type of evidence. So critical research on 
and also critical resource also that is easy to read and that is not behind a paywall because I am mm -hmm. sure that in academia this is happening but uh, the results of that are not uh, diffused and promoted widely so that donors can read it so uh, easy to read critical evaluations of localization would be great to know if what we are doing is uh, effective efficient and is reaching the children and the families that it needs to reach so right. final final thing and i will shut up forever <laughs> no, we, we like it when you continue um but that's a key point too, right? Like to what extent do these localization strategies incorporate children? Children are part of local communities and yet they're often missing from the work that we do on the ground. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll move to Gabriela. Your work has been global, but let's be honest, you have a special place in your heart for the US-Mexico border, which is where you've lived and spent most of your time. Um, and that's a place that, of course, has garnered significant media coverage and has been politicized for decades. Um, and yet you continually reference how so much of the discourse, whether it's happening in research or at the policy level or in the media narratives, around migrant activity at the border excludes the perspective of young people who are crossing the border and maybe also facilitating others crossing, a practice, as you've said, that's sometimes called smuggling. So without including these perspectives of the young people experiencing these movements, um, the coverage has been partial. It's sometimes led to skewed perceptions and misrepresentations. And some of your work has involved working with teenagers, specifically who are involved in these cross-border movements, um, to identify the conditions that have led to their participation, and also to provide solutions and reflect on practices that could create more safety for them. Um, so what have you learned from working with these young people specifically? And how can this learning help close the gap between young migrants' lived experience and the political narratives and other narratives that are circulating about them? Thanks. So thank you so much for, for that question. Um, and yes, I love the US-Mexico border. And please come over and visit us. I, I traveled all over. And I still think that the US-Mexico border is one of the most beautiful places uh, I've ever lived in. And but if, as you just mentioned, one of the um, I think one of the one of the main concerns that I have when we talk about children or children on the border is precisely this proliferation of this melodramatic images, right? Of very small children crossing the border or being abandoned or images of of motherhood and mothering um, that are very that many times are racist and classist. You know, in terms of how how women, families, parenthood um, is represented, I am not saying that 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 people are not vulnerable or that people are not in need of protection. And here, I'm just talking about mostly about the representations, and that's because those images, you know, generate our pity, but they don't lead us to act. We just feel sorry for the people, or oh, I can't believe that they have to go through so much. But that's the level of our engagement. We don't go, you know, as, as a general public, you know, we may feel sorry for the people but really don't feel compelled to do much else. And one of the, um, along the US-Mexico border, another element that we are faced with is the fact that whenever we talk about migration, it's almost inherent or natural, right, for commentators, for, for policymakers, for scholars as myself, to immediately connect it to, to crime <laughs> and to come up with all of these images of representations, right? That um, drug trafficking organizations, you know, have taken over the space, um, that there's a, uh, that there's all of these markets that are operating and that um, are, you know, creating havoc in, in you know, along this, this vast territory. Again, that doesn't mean that violence does not exist. I am really just talking about how all of these messages are circulated and how in that process, 
we don't really get to hear about the people. And one of the one of my main challenges and concerns whenever I'm invited to talk about the border is trying to get people to think beyond those images of organized crime, beyond the representations of the so-called cartels. Uh, I hate that word. We shouldn't be using it, but that's another story. Um, and it, I think it is, you know, again, that that when we only use this designation, but that's the only lens that we are using to take a look at what is happening on the ground, we are at risk of obscuring all of this other dynamics. Um, also, because as as a community, and here I want to I I I talk I'm going to talk about my personal experience, but I I refuse that designation. I refuse the designation of oh the border is you know marginal or the border you know is an inherently um, violent uh, place where there's only bad people out to get you, um, because that is not my community. Uh, our communities along the U.S.-Mexico border have been responding to the humanitarian uh, crisis. They have been providing resources in through a lot of the organizations on both sides of the border that are um, that gather resources. Uh, just people who express their solidarity, you know, but donating their time, their their homes, their, the spaces where they where we come and get together. Um, so again, as, as somebody from you know who loves the border profoundly, you know, I always try to get people to think beyond that. And for me, um, that has that involves um, looking at the experiences of young people on the border. Uh, I think that the U.S.-Mexico border is a place where people are resourceful. Are yes, they have been marginalized. <laughs> they are not. They are not naturally marginal. <laughs> um, you know, historical inequalities, discrimination, lack of employment, lack of access to education and jobs have a, created very serious gaps in terms of the, the ability of people to break patterns, to break cycles of poverty, um, of once again, of discrimination, of um, being able to just work in, in a specific um, markets or fields. And when it comes to to young people, in you know, the work that I've I've had the, the privilege of carrying out in coordination with DIA, this is an, an NGO on the Mexican side of the border in the city of Ciudad Juarez, that's Derechos Humanos Integrales en Acción, um, tries precisely to challenge those characterizations from the people of the border. Um, when DIA first started. Um, looking at the participation of young people in the facilitation of border crossings, and this was around uh, 2015, mm, I was myself assisting um, legal teams identify children who have been removed from the border, taken into detention facilities in the interior, especially you know uh, to the East Coast, um, with the intention to extract intelligence or information about the things that they the activities that they were performing on the border. They were never asked what they wanted to do, if they wanted to stay with their families, if they had access to education, if they had access to medical services, and or or what they wanted to do with their lives. So or being able to work alongside the and the work that to this day they continue doing has involved restoring, you know, in not, not restoring, but actually creating more of that space, giving more of that space, bringing into the discussion, into the conversation, um, the perspectives of these young people. Um, Ian just very kindly shared with us a couple of publications that uh, with the help of, of mm, this young people in India, we have been um, being able to put together that actually show what I was telling you, that, that people who become involved in these kinds of activities don't do it because they are just looking for excitement or because it's cool to be part of a um, of a smuggling group. It is also the result of um, lack of education, lack of opportunities, um, especially for young people on the border. Their knowledge of the geography and the landscape of the rivers, the deserts, the valleys, um, is something that they can take advantage of, they can profit from. Uh, it's also a highly dangerous, very risky activity that leads many of them 
to sustain injuries. You know, um, sadly, as part of the experience in India, we have lost several of our participants, several of our contributors to violence. <laughs> Uh, that comes not only from um, organized crime, but also from law enforcement, you know, on both sides of the border. So, but what I think, you know, and this is just the close that I've learned the most from this entire experience is about that, about the the strength, the determination, and the the refusal of the people from the border to being classified or to being cataloged in a single way. And for that, you know. You know, as part of that process, young people are fundamental. Thank you so much. So Gabriela does some also really interesting work on, besides all that's published here in the chat that you can see, really helping students think about how to do research with young people who are vulnerable, but also very resourceful and resilient in an ethical way. Um, and I think, you know, that's maybe something we can come back to later in the conversation is, you know, we often are told like, oh, you can't interview children under the age of 18, which makes sense for a lot of reasons, right? For child protective reasons. And we do a disservice when we don't engage children in that research in a way that's very ethically rigorous. So Gabriela is a great source for um, thinking about how to do that. And thank you for, for bringing that learning and those ideas to, to Georgetown. Um, okay, so now we'll move to Stephen, who, as you heard earlier, has a really multi multifaceted background um, and training in law, social work experience with child protection implementation in a variety of humanitarian and crisis settings, and also working in New York City with families um, and working in policy. Um, and in everything you've done, you've centered children and youth. Um, You've often said that uh, every encounter with a child is an opportunity to create healing. Um, and you have insisted that this is also a realistic and possible and important approach in a policy space. You've recently been doing this kind of work with the um, US Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, to make sure that there are mechanisms in place for young people who've experienced the system going through the Office of Refugee Resettlement to comment on it and to inform how it operates. And you've been key to setting up that link between lived experience as expertise and policy practice. So how can, from what you've learned, like what, what can you say about how policymakers and government agencies can create those kind of opportunities to really listen to and learn from the young people that they're meant to serve? Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Gillian. And, and I just feel so honored and, and it's such a, so amazing to, to listen to, to Mara, to Gabriela, and I know from Vlad later, like it's so, everything just comes together, right? What I'm hearing from Mara, from Gabriela, my experience is we need to walk the talk, right? When we talk about engaging young people, engaging those with lived experience, are we just projecting our own ideas, our own stereotypes, our own classification, our own cataloging? Or are we generally creating spaces for young people, for those who experience uh, creating spaces for them to present themselves as they are in all of the richness, all of their complications, um, all of their... The, 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 the resiliency and the challenges. And, and that has been a journey for me in the last uh, 25 years, uh, whether as a therapist, a social worker, as a policymaker, whether it's working and navigating the child welfare system in New York City, uh, working with a U.S. government on the southern border, uh, working in post-conflict Liberia, we, in Pakistan with refugees from Afghanistan. And, and as Gillian, as you shared, you know, my experience has been um, that in every interaction, every interaction with a young person, regardless of its length, five minutes, one minute, this offers a pathway for connection and learning. And what I want to share, I want to share, uh, you know, through the eyes of, of a young person, uh, seven relational lenses, seven ways to connect with a young person. Um, so uh, the first one, care about me. Show me that I matter to you. What does that mean? 
be dependable, respectful, honest, even and especially about uncertainties. Tell me when you don't know. Communicate clearly and inform me of risk so I can make informed decisions. So that's the first one, care about. The second one, listen to me. Really, really pay attention when we are together. What does this mean? Stay present, attentive, validate my experiences and my emotions. Aim to understand, connect with, and learn from me. The third one, be warm with me. Show me you enjoy being with me. Consistently encourage, support, and praise me. Be patient and, this is key, follow my lead on how to connect. Let me set that relationship of how I want to connect with you. Fourth one, support me. Help me complete tasks and achieve goals. This can be help me plan, set clear boundaries, advocate for me, guide me through challenges, and believe in me. Believe in me. And something I have learned from young people is they can read through BS. They read through BS and, 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 and so they can see and they can feel it. Believe in me. The fifth one, challenge me to grow. Push me to keep getting better. It's about encouraging me to fulfill my potential and push me beyond my comfort zone. Hold me accountable and help me learn from my successes and our failures. If something I have learned in my 25 years in this work is I constantly make mistakes. I'm deeply, deeply imperfect as a human being. Um, how do we ensure that there are those spaces where we make mistakes and we're given an opportunity to learn from and respond from our mistakes? Six, expand my possibilities. Connect me with people and experiences that broaden my world. Enrich my perspective. Introduce me to new ideas, places, experiences, and mentors. Help me expand my world. And the last one, and a critical one, is share power with me. Respect and empower me. What does this mean? Involve me in decisions, collaborate on solutions, allow me to lead and honor my narrative and choices. And this goes to what Gabriela and Mara so, so strongly stated. Let me tell my story the way I want to share my story. That is critical. Recognize and value my contributions. So those are seven sort of ways of connecting with a young person that are based in terms of the 25 years I've been doing this work and, and from others who've, who've worked on this. And I think ultimately it's a space where we generally need to be in that space where we're listening to, genuinely listening, meeting young people where they are, unconditionally accepting what they share with us, their feelings. Um, and, and, that is, it, it, and that is what then opens it up for, for engaging and, and for a relationship. But this is critical in everything we do. And it doesn't matter whether you're a grant maker, whether you're a policy maker, whether you're right directly working with a child, every opportunity, every interaction, it's that way that you engage with. You don't speak great Spanish, but you try to speak in Spanish. You, you maintain eye contact, you engage, you let them know, I see you. And I see you as you are. I see you as you want to be seen, as you want to be presented. I am not representing anyone. I honestly hate this whole thing. We represent children. We're, no, what we should be doing is creating spaces, elevating spaces for young people, for children, for parents to present themselves as they are. And what that requires from us is to give up our projections, our sanitized comfort zones, and to be comfortable in discomfort and to be challenged in those ways and to ultimately share power because ultimately that's what helps us all globally. That's my uh, spiel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I love it. When you listen to Stephen, you know, you think, okay, he's a social worker. He's sounding like a therapist. But what's very cool is when you see him apply that same stuff to policy spaces, because it is the same principles. If we're actually serious about child participation um, and lived experiences, expertise, I mean, are we as policymakers, as people 
on Capitol Hill or at USAID or at the UN? Are we prepared to do things differently and to be changed because of what we've heard from the people that we say we're serving? Um, so it's really, you're really humbling when you actually, you know, and you do that with us too as a team, right? Like, you know, hang on, we're not just a, a university producing research and this kind of thing. We're actually, are we serious about what we were saying about lifting up the children of lived experience first? Thank you, Stephen. Okay, over to Kiev. Vlad, I, I just want to give a special shout out to Vlad because as he's been with us in the midst of war, he has joined meetings after, you know, while air sirens are going off after his neighbor's apartment has been bombed. And he consistently shows up because of his commitment to making sure that the stuff that he's working on is actually visible to the world. He, um, it's so inspiring. I mean, you're truly doing emergency research and it's an honor to have seen you in the midst of this and your courage and tenacity. And so before the full scale invasion of Ukraine, you were primarily working as a research historian and a seminarian religious scholar looking at the history of the Soviet mass deportation of Ukrainians. Um, and then, as you mentioned in your opening comments, you became aware that history was repeating itself and that um, the Russians were actually once again in a very coordinated, organized, systematic way, deporting Ukrainian civilians, many of whom were children. Um, and we don't know the exact numbers, the documented official numbers are 20,000, but as you've said, it could be up to 150 or more. Um, so this is the largest missing children's case since World War II. And you are really on the front lines of making this crisis known to the world. Um, it's, there's a lot to say about how the international community has not mobilized around this. And a lot of the work is being truly led by Ukrainian researchers like you and civil society partners. Um, so you're, you're really doing emergency research. So what is at stake um, as you do this and how can your work be supported? What do you guys need to, to continue and to get the support from the international community that you need? Thank you, Gillian, for this question. It's honor to me to be a part of this comment. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, say about uh, introduction, about historical background of this criminal process, what Russia do right now. Because uh, why I uh, still doing this investigation? Because um, a forcible deportation of children and uh, a forcible deportation of children and adults people from Ukraine, it's not a new phenomenon. It's not a new practice. Because uh, maybe uh, you ever heard about uh, um, speech of uh, President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, that uh, uh, he said that um, uh, broken out of Soviet regime, for him it's, uh, it's a problem. But uh, uh, he still doing uh, uh, Soviet crimes because we know uh, from a Soviet period that uh, at least in, for example, in 1930-1931, from Ukrainian, especially lands to Siberia, uh, deported more than 130 persons. It's a villagers from Ukraine, and after that, uh, uh, Soviet regime. Uh, deported uh, from four waves more than 1,133,000 people. It's in Soviet period. And for example, I could uh, explain about um, deportation of children from Baltic states, for example, from Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, when uh, Soviet uh, KGB regime deported these uh, children to Siberia, they uh, grow up in uh, Siberia uh, places and uh, they uh, 
Soviet regime try to erase their identity, try to erase their nationality. That's why it's so dangerous. And uh, as uh, as a, an historian, I understand that Russia doing the same practice right now. Uh, after full-scale invasion, uh, just uh, before full-scale invasion, full-scale invasion in Ukraine started 24 February 2022. But we know about in 19 February that Russian soldiers forcibly deported people from occupied Luhansk region to Rostov region in Russia. After that, when they occupied new and new uh, Ukrainian land, they every day deported children from these occupied territories. From our investigation, we know that at least uh, 50, 60 uh, hundred, uh, 50, 60 places, uh, location, it's named temporary accommodation centers in territory of Russian Federation, where they, uh, uh, where they, uh, in these places, they deported children from Ukraine. And we, uh, nobody knows who are these children because we have no information about these children. We know that uh, uh, at least 100,000 children uh, are forcibly removed from Ukraine to Russia, but I identified children, only 19,566, and returned to home just 388. It's, it's a, a very dangerous situation because uh, when we try to come back these children to home, it could be a many years. But we we have no this time because uh, every day uh, after deportation, it's not a, a end of process of this criminal process because after deportation, where when these children stay in this location in territory of Russia, uh, every day uh, Russia government try to russify and militarize these children. We know about a different paramilitary organization in the territory of Russia. For example, Young Army uh, Movement of First Eagles of Russia. And in this paramilitary organization, they try to erase identity of Ukrainian children. And especially boys, they try to put boys, teenagers to paramilitary forces, doing with them um, especially military lessons. And after that, they try to create a future mobilization, mobilization sources to Russian army. And we know about one of these cases. I uh, tell this uh, for our colleagues, for example, about a teenager. He's named uh, Anatoly. He uh, grown up in occupied Donetsk. Donetsk uh, occupied from 2014. And after that, he put to Russian army. It's Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian young man, but he fighting against Ukraine. It's a dangerous situation because uh, for a pity right now, he has no Ukrainian identity and it's dangerous situation for us. And what uh, international society could uh, help to us? It's a very uh, big part of work because just a few organizations are investigating this process. And uh, uh, we should reload uh, and uh, improve the international system of children care, uh, especially uh, for Ukraine. Because, for example, uh, when we try to identify Ukrainian children, just only International Committee of Red Cross, just UNICEF could have some information about children who are in Russian territory, because Ukrainian uh, society and Ukrainian go government have no uh, deeply information about these children. And when uh, we have no information of these children, it's so hard to return these children to home. And that's why uh, it's so important to us to have international support in, in, in this problem. And uh, it's especially uh, important to have support from uh, 
international universities, international funding, because uh, just, uh, uh, for example, in Ukraine, just a few organizations are every day still doing this investigation. And it's so hard because just a uh, few organizations doing this process, but a lot of evidence, a lot of children. And we have... Uh, no so much resources resources for for that you know and that's why uh, it's so important to support this investigation because we uh, not have so much time to return these children to home and if we could immediately return these children to home if we could create uh, uh, Unify and join these children to home. It's uh, a main topic for us, and that's why it's so important to us. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah, your um, the connection was cutting a little bit at the end, but I, we got most of it. So thank you so much. I think you might have frozen actually. Um, I think it's so important to say that what Vlad is working on. Um, forcible deportation of children under the Genes genocide convention is an act of genocide. Um, and thanks to the work that Vlad and other colleagues are doing, um, it has been recognized as genocide in the European Parliament, for instance. Um, and actually, the our Congress in the United States just passed a resolution a few weeks ago also recognizing this as an act of genocide. Um, but it's going to be impossible to prosecute war crimes without the research and the data. So what Vlad is doing in coordination with other civil society partners is also informing the Office of the General Prosecutor, the International Criminal Court. Um, so this work is really like frontline human rights research um, and life-saving, hopefully. Um, and I would also say it's primarily under, you know, not funded. He's doing a lot of this work um, because he's a Ukrainian who cares about his population. Um, and the international community is not funding uh, to the extent that it could the research and the work to document this and respond to it. So um, and I, I would also just like to point out that he he's been extraordinarily collaborative. I mean, it was Vlad and his team who reached out to Georgetown to say, can we be part of this work? Um, they organized a webinar in July last year when nobody was talking about this. And he has since coordinated with the State Department, with um, the Yale Humanitarian Research Lab, with other universities, for instance, students at Hamilton College who are interested in learning how to use the open source intelligence work to help the cause. Vlad has really been coordinating a lot of that. So truly collaborative um, process and spirit. And it's an honor to watch you mobilize and get it done. Yeah, thank you. OK, so let's get back into conversation mode. Um, you're all innovators. You're all on the kind of cutting edge of this work because this is an emerging field. Like when I was a student, there was no opportunity to learn about how to do child-centered research or child-centered policy or child-centered practice. We were kind of winging it and learning along the way. So I'll just ask you guys some, for some reflections. What are the challenges and opportunities in doing this work at this sort of place and time? And what do students and early career professionals need to do to prepare to engage in this kind of work? What would you tell your younger self if you were a student or an early career professional? Thoughts? Gabriela, <laughs> I'll call on you because I know you have good reflections on this. Why me? Why me? No. Um... Especially, you know, because the last question I know, and here I'm going to out Stephen, but you know, that came from him. <laughs> what would I have told myself, you know, um, as a migrant, as somebody who uh, who arrived to the U.S. as a teenager, um, I would 
remind myself, and I will tell people, you know, uh, that those experiences that what we went through, what we experienced, you know, coming in um, or staying or spending time in detention, um, having to adjust our status, having to do all of this, you know, um, things that many times, you know, were probably not necessarily licit, um, all of that is is your story, you know, and at the same time, it, it matters. Um, I think that I, I remember being told some, uh, at some point when I applied for a fellowship, um, that, uh, the person who was coordinating and saying, he's like, but, but you, but you're a migrant, you really don't have, you know, I don't know why you want to study migrants. <laughs> um, and not having anybody in my family who had, uh, you know, a college education, you know, I, I remember thinking like, maybe she's right. Maybe I shouldn't, this, this is not my place. And I, I learned how important it is to create those spaces for, for, for us. Um, as you were saying, when I, I, um, I know that indicate that there was, you know, not a lot, a lot of the work that I do, I never got specific training for it. It was nothing like, there was not a class on migrant smuggling and there was not a, or a class on, on migration related crimes. Um, but it was, um, I was, I was always trying to find allies and also to, to create my, my, you know, many cases, my own spaces to do this kind of research. Um, this involved many times, not necessarily listening to the first opinion that I received by, you know, from professors uh, or again from advisors. Um, I was given many times wrong information about the research process. And so looking for other opinions, looking for other researchers who are doing similar work uh, or looking for people who are probably outside of academia, not doing necessarily that work, but who can give you insights in terms of how to um, um, how to build those spaces. You know, I think that that, again, something that has been along borders for me on borders around the world people always accommodate you people always find spaces for you so being able to to recognize that and not being afraid not being scared of of um looking again for all of these spaces takes time but can be done <laughs> thank you anyone else want to chime in on one of those questions. I mean, you can broaden it too. I mean, what what could universities do to help prepare people for this kind of work? I mean, one of the things we say, you know, some people say we're the collaborative on global children's issues. And so some people say, well, what are global children's issues? And our response is often, well, what aren't global children's issues? I mean, if you think about it, children and youth comprise 40% of the global population. So any challenge that's facing the world is, of course, affecting children, um, and sometimes in really unique ways. Um, but we are not necessarily trained to think about the ways those things affect children, right? I mean, you can go through an education on, you know, focusing on climate change and never think about the specific impacts of climate change on young people. Um, so what do universities need to do to make sure that our curricular curriculum is also child-centered or includes a child-centered focus. If I can speak. Um, so Joan made the, made the question and I was going to cite Joan. So for full circle um, on her Q&A uh, for the website, she explains that being a child advocate is not someone else's responsibility. It calls on all of us to keep the best interests of children and families in mind in our work. And it is connected to what you have just said. We live in, in extremely unequal and fair societies where many times the burden of these un, un, inequalities and injustices fall on children. And we can see that because there's a lot of empiric evidence for that. And 
So I would say that to students, even if you end up not working in international cooperation, not uh, working in human rights, it doesn't matter what you do really. It is important that you contribute to making societies more equal, just, fair, and democratic, because that is the way to make sure that children's rights are fulfilled. A lot of uh, why children's rights are violated has to do with wider societal injustices, racism, uh, machismo in our countries, uh, patriarchy, etc., colonial colonization, etc. So wider and uh, social phenomena. And I think it is important that each of us, it doesn't matter what we do, you don't need to be a children's rights advocate officially to care about making societies uh, more just and friendlier and fairer for children. So I like that reflection a lot. Hmm. Thanks, yeah. Vlad, what would you say? I mean, you're here, well, all of you are working on really critical emergency issues in a sense, whether it's migration, kids at the border. Um, what would you say? I mean, we don't often think about research as an emergency humanitarian response, especially child-focused research. Um, so what would you say? What do we need to do as a university or maybe donors? What, what can we do to make the kind of work that you're doing easier? Or more visible. Uh, yes, you know uh, when uh, war is started in Ukraine, I am just uh, thinking about how my academician background could be most useful, helpful for our country, for helping to fighting for their uh, freedom. And it's a main uh, issues for me and for uh, my colleagues, researchers from Ukraine. And uh, after that, uh, you should uh, remember when you started this difficult uh, investigation about a special war crimes against children, about uh, children cares in war situation in a country who are under bombing, for our under war crimes, you should remember that it's um, most important uh, uh, work for you because you should save uh, a next generation of your people, uh, next generation of your society, a future of your country. And this, that's why it's most important for us. And for uh, our uh, academician colleagues, it, it could be very important too, because it's uh, if uh, we discuss today, it's the uh, uh, largest uh, mass deportation after Second World War. And these, uh, these cases are important for uh, all over the world, because it's a uh, most uh, difficult uh, deportation from from. Uh, last uh, 80 years and uh, uh, if uh, we talking ab about some support uh, we should have um, a lot of collaboration with different uh, international university with uh, funding and donors because if we have this support we could uh, do a, a lot of work uh, we could uh, involve to our work more people, more researchers, more sources to investigate this problem. Especially, um, you should have uh, specialized uh, knowledge. You should uh, uh, learn in OSINT, for example, OSINT skills. Uh, and some of these uh, uh, courses uh, are... Uh, not for free, for example, but you should know this information because it, when you want to um, investigate sensitive information about children, you should know these skills. And that's why you should uh, have a sources for that. Uh, you should uh, have a lot of uh, comments, uh, a lot of participants in your comments, especially uh, professional researchers. 
because you should have a good academician background because uh, every day you should uh, uh, read a lot of sources, a lot of information, and uh, you should have a skills how to separate important information, not important information, uh, what information could be useful, for for example, for share to in international society, what information are sensitive and couldn't be shared to public, but you should collect this information to improve, uh, for example, war crimes against uh, some of Russian persons to improve international sanctions against Russian persons who are involved in, in process of deportation. And that's why you should have a source to do all of these things. And that's why you should have co co collaboration with different yeah. partners. I mean, it's been fascinating watching Vlad work because, of course, much of this data that he's working with is extremely sensitive. And sometimes, if it's made public, um, that can put the children who've been deported at even more risk. They can be taken from where they are and, and moved again. So starting the process all over again to try to document them. So um, this, you know, there are a lot of volunteers working on this research, but it's extremely technically sophisticated. Um, and understanding how to do that and do it well is so important. And it takes resources to protect data, to create secure servers, especially when there are researchers working from all over the world and trying to combine. So sharing data is so critical. It's, it's fascinating and underdeveloped. I mean, we have to do more and better for sure to advance this work. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question, and then I want to open it up also for the audience. So audience, if you have any questions for the fellows, feel free to you put them in the Q&A. Um, but do any of you want to reflect on, I mean, the collaborative, being part of the collaborative doesn't give you tons of resources. It doesn't um, make you rich, right? Nobody gets rich doing this kind of work. Um, but what does it do? What does being part of the collaborative how does it help your work? Anybody so, want to mention? If I can, I, if I can share, I mean, I think it's connected to everything that we've heard earlier from, from Gabriela, Vlad and Mara just now. The collaborative is the space where it's a space of encounter, of an interconnection, of the, all the ways we're connected and entangled with each other. I think as, as we've all experienced, you know, the four of us work in, in, in related but different types of areas of work, different ways of engaging, and yet we're all connected and, and visibilizing. And I think what the collaborative stuff does is it visibilizes and elevates the spaces where this conversation are taking place. It's breaking down the silos as you earlier mentioned, Gillian, because as you, as you also said, you know, in real life, we don't exist in silos, right? As Mara was and, and Gabriela were so strongly, you know, we are not monolithic creatures. You know, we're not, no one is. And, and when we project that onto others, we're losing the essence of who we are, the essence and the, the opportunity to connect and engage with each other. And for me, that's what the collaborative is, is a space that, that elevates, that visibilizes, that connects and interconnects. And that hopefully also, you know, when I think of my younger self and, and thinking about, you know, as I went into this, this work, is the collaborative in, in many ways encapsulates it, the sense of networking of relationships, right? It's all the relationships. And if I can give any advice to any, any young professionals or students who are thinking about it, it's relationships, connect with people, reach out to people. And also it's a space where you need to be comfortable with discomfort. You need to also be aware of yourself, the self-awareness about who you are, your own biases that you're bringing into it and being open with humility that you don't have all the answers, that we are all imperfect, and it's and it's and it's about getting in and you know engaging in that space, be, being brave to jump in into that space that can be messy, complicated, um, and open. And you know, to this day, I constantly, at every level, I'm constantly learning. I'm making mistakes, and and it's just having that openness to to always learn and and through a through a through a lens of humility. So that's what I have experienced with the with the collaborative, and it's just a really unique unique way of engaging and encountering and expanding and really expanding itself. And, and the last thing I'll share is also through a space of hope. I really think my experience with this work is it has to come from hope. You know, I think I always think about Hannah Arendt and how she said that in every birth, there's there's hope, there's a new opportunity. And I think that especially in the times where we live, 
it's and that's I've always learned from 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 the young people, children, families, parents I work with. It's hope is that what's so essential in our lives, and that which gives us, and that which it, it's such it can really guide us and 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 motivate us, and and it has to be from a space of hope while being realistic in terms of all the challenges. But that's that's my my experience. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else want to chime in on any of the? Other reflections? What you mentioned before about innovation, that uh, the collaborative gives gives space to topics that are a little bit neglected or that don't receive as much attention by international cooperation. And that is really important. And that is another advice that I have for students to follow their interests, even if they are niche or no one cares about that. I wrote my thesis on decolonization more than more than 10 years ago. Um, and now it became a little bit, it is not a hegemonic yet, but there are many more organizations speaking about decolonization and publishing about this than before. And um, so I encourage them very much to pursue their, their true interest. So like what uh, Bratislav did for Ukraine, Gabriela has done based on her experience as a migrant. You can also take your experiences, even if you think that they are not important, and turn them into your work. And that is a huge contribution that you can make to your people or to your community. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things I would also say is that, um, well, we had a graduate student last year who did a scrub of the curriculum uh, to see kind of how are we preparing people going into the foreign service, for instance, to think about the global challenges from the lens of children and youth. And she was a she came from a gender studies background, women's studies. And after she did this scrub, she said, oh, my God, we're doing to children what we used to do to women. They're just not there. And I thought that was really interesting, you know. Um, and so sometimes, you know, when you work with children, especially as a woman, people are like, oh, that's that's cute. You know, working with children is cute. It's soft. It's sweet. And you're like, no. I mean, when you listen to Vlad or listen to Gabriela, does that sound soft or sweet? I mean, they're working on the toughest issues of the world with extra sensitivity because it involves children. So that's like the rigor that goes into doing good work on behalf of children is extraordinary. And yet many of us are going into those fields not being trained. So, you know, in, in some ways, um, doing this work feels like I'm satisfying the 25 year old me, you know, who had the job with the UN in wartime Angola, feeling really prepared and really grateful to have this work until I started working with child soldiers. And then thought, oh my goodness, in all of my great education and fabulous training, nothing prepared me for this. And so I feel like, you know, Stephen, when you talk about like, what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> It's like, okay, notice what's missing in the world um, of your training, of your practice, of your field, of your, you know, and maybe in 25 years, you'll be, be able to correct that or create that space. Um, so for me, it's a huge joy to be with people who are like, oh, yes, we want to fill that gap and stand in the, the space. Um, so there was a question in the chat. Um, how would you recommend nonprofit organizations working with immigrant children and youth under traditional so social service protocols to create spaces and systems within their programming to establish authentic and ethical partnerships with children and youth and help to elevate their voices and lived experiences? Anyone want to take that? Come May I say on. something? Yeah. We asked them. <laughs> uh, I think that I, I, I recognize the fact that, you know, again, um, having um, witnessing, you know, some a lot of the challenges that come with uh, with welcoming and receiving children, um, young people and families and, and the, the vast 
number of needs that they have, that it is very difficult to sit down and actually, you know, ask people, ask one-on-ones like what they what they actually need or want. Uh, but I think that we need to carve the time. We really need to make, to create those spaces because if not, you know, we just, I think that especially along the US-Mexico border, um, most of the organizations are prepared to receive people and to see them leave right away. So there is really not a lot of engagement with other than attending to the most basic needs, you know, at that point. Does he, do you have clothes? Do you have shoes? Do you have a place to get to? You know, uh, do you have the phone number with you? Mm-hmm. And but I think it it also involves starting to build those relationships, uh, keeping um uh, keeping in touch with with people. Where do they go? What are the needs that they have once they reach a specific destination? For those, you know, I know that again in the context in the context of the U.S. Mexico border is very um mo- the vast majority of people are going to leave. But for those who decide to stay, or for those who decide to stay in contact, what would have worked for you? What would ha- what would you have liked to see? And start investing on that too. I think that many times I see that in you know my own work. Sometimes I'm like, if I could just have that the clarity of mind to sit down and to prepare and to think about all of these elements, you know, uh, I think we could uh, we could create that. But it also again, as uh, Stephen was saying listen to what they have to say and you know let them come as they, as they are because that's many other many times the other challenge right that oh it's a little child mm-hmm. we infantilize them and these are kids who already travel by their you know on their own they cross the body and they came all the way from Guatemala, Honduras uh, you know West Africa they have seen half of the world and we're still telling them you know how they should how they should tie their shoes or what they should eat <laughs> so um, again, I think in engaging them at that level and making a, a, consent, a, 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 a deep, a committed investment into what they what they would like to see is, is essential. And I just want to add on to what Gabriela is saying, because some people say, well, but we don't have enough time. We, you know, this is we only see them for this. I think every encounter is that opportunity. And, and when we talk about it, it's asking, right? It's, it's you know, I, I remember this experience talking with, with uh, uh, then uh, she was 16 years old. She crossed the border, pregnant, and she still remembers the encounter with a border patrol person who, who, was a, uh, who found her. And that five minute encounter where he, get, he, in Spanish, gave her a bottle of water, gave her information. This is what's going to happen to you over the next hour. That space, you know, and she still remembers that experience. That encounter that lasted a few minutes with this person and that stayed with her. And I think that too many times we just, you know, we forget that, you know, it's every, every, every moment you connect, every moment you engage. And and it's about seeing that person. It's about sharing information. Information is power. And we don't realize, oh, we feel like, no, I can't tell this, as as Gabriela just said, this child, I can't tell them that it's going to be really hard to find their mother. I'm going to come up with a sweet lie. And tell them, oh, we're still looking. Oh, we don't know. This child crossed the board on themselves. The issue here is you can't handle having an uncomfortable conversation. So I think it's important and it's not easy. So how do you have those conversations? But don't project, you know, our own discomforts onto others. And, and really from the space of like, you know, we really need to change the way we walk. Um, and that starts with humility and that starts with self-awareness and that starts with not and, and even within huge bureaucracies, whether it's the U.S. government, like, yes, things you can change systemically and absolutely, but you don't need to wait to start acting in a way that sees the, per, the, the young person, the parent, the person as as a human being. Right. You, there, and, and that is felt. Those are the, all the nonverbal ways we communicate, the ways that we show are distracted. There's the way we just like oh, there, there is every sentence, every your face, your body, your voice everything communicate we're communi- constantly communicating unconsciously conscious we're, com- we're beings we're social beings we're born into this world to connect a baby learns how to be themselves through connection and and if we we we, we, we if we remind ourselves and connection is intersubjective it's both in terms of the ways that i'm influenced and are in, and i influence others and as long as we're open to this idea that we each impact no matter what role we play, what lens we come in from, we're always communicating with each other. And I think that's that's a really important starting point of sorts. Thank you. 
So we have a few minutes left. Why don't we each spend one minute to say what you're hopeful about in this field of child-centered research policy or practice? Where, where are we headed as a field? It's a new field. It's, uh, it's a new discipline in a sense. So what are you excited about? Sorry, catching you on the spot. I'm excited that universities are beginning to notice that this is a field of practice and that we have more to do and they're creating spaces for it. I'm excited that there is, that as the, um, as the migrant population continues to grow, more people, you know, with migrant backgrounds become involved in the, in, in the decisions that are made around um, programming, but also within research and policy. Yeah, so from my side, like I said before, the the issue of coloniality within in, within international development is becoming more popular, so as to say, and that gives me a lot of hope because, as Gabriela said, I also agree that leadership positions should be occupied by people with lived experiences, basically in the global south or as by migrants, etc., refugees women, survivors of gender-based violence, etc. So that makes me hopeful. And the second thing is what you mentioned before, that children's rights, child issues is becoming a more critical area of study. And that will most probably help us move away from charity-based perspective, you know, approaches and paternalistic approaches. Children are like some cute type of topic that only women care about and these more traditional approaches that are useless. So those two things make me hopeful. Hmm. Uh, and from my side, I want to add that uh, it's an uh, honor to me that children cares and uh, children rights, especially children rights in war, uh, became a new discipline maybe in future for uh, different researcher and uh, universities and uh, for example uh, life stories uh, uh, of Ukrainian children especially it could be shared to international society we have no chance before war to have this a chance but right now uh, I hope uh, it could be uh, useful and it could be effective to help uh, uh, children care uh, for Ukrainian children and for other ch children all over the world in this uh, experience uh, to have a new level of children protections. Mm. And I, you know, I'm hopeful because I do generally believe and, and experience that there's so much more that, that connects us. Um, than than we sometimes uh, you know, experience uh, when we look at you know the media and the, all the ways all the all those different silos of of vitriol and and I and it, you know for me it comes down to you know there's sort of uh, I guess four parts to this one is the space I think what I've experienced when there's hope in me is when we when we when we see the other when we accept I accept you as I are as you are I accept. The feelings I unconditionally accept the feelings you share with me. I accept your story as as your story, um, and it doesn't mean we agree with a story. It means that we see that person. I see you. I see if this is something that's that ma makes you this that you experience this way. Then I can see why you're so upset. So it's about acceptance connected with empathy. We are all again as a human on a human level. We're so much more. As much as we try to make ourselves unique and this, you know, bigotry of different small differences, we are, there's so much, we are essentially, there's so much more that we are similar than, 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 than different in terms of the essence of our, our human essence and, and engaging with empathy, with, with, with recognizing and seeing, I see the, how hard this is. I see that this is not easy. And with curiosity, it goes back to what Gabriela said. I want to, I want to learn about you. I want you to teach me about you and how I can see you, support you. And the last thing for me, it's, it has to be, it's so essential that joy be a part of that conversation, that hope and joy 
because I feel that that's what 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 is so essential in life, and and that so many times we miss, even in the midst of, of the most challenging circumstances, finding hope, uh, feeling hope, and 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 joy, and it's through others that my we 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 most times experience that. So, amen to that. Thank you for um for bringing that hope and that joy daily, honestly, to the work that we're doing here. Um, and I wanna give again a shout out to Joan Lombardi who conceived of this and especially made um, a point to make sure we were learning from the fields and creating this fellowship opportunity. And to Ian Manzi, who um, is also behind the scenes and a key part of our team, also bringing real lived experiences, expertise into this work and also academic rigor and um, a collaborative spirit. I say that's the, the most incredible thing about all of you is the way that you show up in this space with truly collaborative spirits, lifting each other up, lifting up the work, finding ways to connect dots and um, grow stronger as a team, but also this field of practice. So we'll end the webinar here, but the conversation and the work, of course, continue. And um, thanks for everything. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much, Gillian and Joan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.